Hello class, and welcome to Introduction to Materials Science and Engineering. I am so excited to teach this class this semester. Now, I'm going to describe how this class is going to work. For those of you that are material science students, this is Introduction to Material Science and Engineering. For those of you that are mechanical or civil or other engineers, this is Elements of Material Science. Um, and in the next video, I'll describe how it's going to work, because we're online, and it's going to be a little bit different than in years past, and that's fine. But in this video, I want to keep it brief, and I want to just answer two main questions, and they are as follows. What on earth is material science? And the second one is, why should you care about it, right? Why did they put this in your curriculum that they thought it was important enough that you should actually take this class? So let me answer those in turn. First one, what is material science? Well, to start that one off, we should just recognize, and you probably already know this, that society faces some enormous challenges grand challenges, in fact, in the 21st century. The National Academy of Science and Engineering, they got together and they identified 14 grand challenges that we face as a society um, that are related to engineering. Here they are, our 14 grand challenges, things like advancing personalized education, making solar energy economical, reverse engineering the brain, engineering better medicines, restoring and improving urban infrastructure. These are big things, right? Clean water, preventing terror, providing energy from fusion, managing the nitrogen cycle. And what's crazy is that as I look through these, I see that about half of them, maybe eight of the 14, will require new advances in technology uh, made possible by new materials. And that's not an uncommon thing. In fact, if we look at technology all the time, technology is almost always limited by the materials that are available to it at any given moment. And every time we come up with a new breakthrough material, it almost always enables some new technology. There's lots of cool examples of this. For example, this, yeah, here we have the Tesla Cybertruck, which is made of this new alloy. And first off, it looks ridiculous, or you love it. You either love it or hate it. But the shape of it is not just because they like that design. It's on purpose. They made this out of 30X cold rolled stainless steel. It's an austenitic steel. It's much more um, brittle and hard and strong and way less malleable and ductile. So they can't stamp it to have these nice smooth shapes. They have to go with nice rigid hard lines instead. Um, but the benefit is that you get a very strong material. There's no internal frame on this. The entire frame, the, there's no chassis. The skeleton you know, on the outside of the vehicle is the chassis essentially. It's an exoskeleton. They um, have extremely scratch and dent resistant material here. So that's an example of one material, but there's lots of others. How about the iPhone and the Android smartphone Gorilla Glass? So every year, iPhones and Androids come out with new phones and they always tout that they have better glass. None of us want to have a smartphone where the glass shatters and breaks. And so they've been getting better and better at making these glasses. And then they turn around and sell it to consumers as a new advancement. Whether that's waterproof, whether that's capacitive touch, whether that's fracture resistance, there's lots of great new things that are coming out of, say, the glass industry and technology. And then how about this one? Electric vehicle degradation. Auto companies are falling over themselves to improve battery performance. Not only is the battery one of the most expensive part of electric vehicles, but it's also one that wears away over time. And if you look at these, say like the Nissan Leaf, which is a popular electric vehicle um, in terms of sales, if you look at their battery performance, they went from a 24 kilowatt hour battery to a larger 30 kilowatt hour battery. But look at what happened. This is their battery retention, right? The battery state of health. You can think of that like the battery as ability to keep its charge over time. After about seven years, it had dropped a little bit, you know, close to 70% of its initial charge. So it's only 70% as efficient as it was on its day one. It doesn't hold as much capacitance. But in their new battery, it fell off much, much faster. Now compare that to this article, which was talking about an advancement that came from Tesla, where even after it was almost 300,000 miles, which is about 300,000 kilometers, which is about 186,000 miles, it's still at 90% or better in its performance. So uh, the point here is that new technology very often is limited by the materials that are available, not how we put them to, together, although that also can make new technology. It's usually new materials themselves that make technology possible, which is important for all of you mechanicals and civils and chemicals and electrical engineers because you're all gonna go out and make things in the real world and this allows you to have better things to make them with is material science. So, I, one last quote here on what is material science and engineering then. Um, this comes from Rustam Roy, one of the early pioneers in the field. He said the following, material science is syncretic. That means it puts different things together. It's a syncretic discipline hybridizing metallurgy, ceramics, solid state physics, and chemistry. It is the first example 
of a new academic discipline emerging by fusion rather than fission. So instead of science getting split off into sub-disciplines, this is an example of something where we bring everything together. So if you like chemistry, but you also like physics and math and science and all these things, and you want to see the big picture as opposed to some tiny little sliver, that's material science. It looks at the big picture of all the materials that are around us, okay, to solve problems that are relevant to us, either for humanity or for new technology or whatever it may be. Oftentimes, materials are the solution. So that's the first thing of what is material science. The second thing is this. What do all of these things have in common? Right? So I made this graphic a few years ago. Um, you've got stainless steel, you've got Teflon, you've got a high temperature superconductor, you've got shatter resistant glass, Play-Doh, artificial sweeteners, Viagra, vulcanized rubber, super glue. We could just go on. Like This is not even all of them. This is just some. What do these things have in common? Every single one of these things was discovered by accident. Total accident! A total goof. Somebody messed up in the lab. It was a mistake. It was some happenstance. It was pure, sheer, dumb luck. They were all discovered by accident. There's some cool background story behind most of these things. So the question I have for you, if we are trying to solve the big problems, global warming, air pollution, we want better vehicles, we want better health outcomes, we want to prevent terror, can we rely on sheer, dumb luck, <laughs> right? Accidental materials discovery as we do it? Um, I would say no. And so the discipline of material science and engineering is actively trying to discover new materials. We're trying to find rational ways to go out to find new alloys, new ceramics, new glasses, new polymers, new plastics, right? We want all of these things to be better in terms of their properties, but we need a rational way to find them because if you just drop, you know, some random composition out there and try it, uh, it's like pulling a number out of a hat you're not going to get very lucky very often. So we need a better, more rational way to do it. In fact, I just gave a talk on this that you can check out where I don't. I think that we can use materials informatics to drastically accelerate the way that we discover new materials. Third um, is this idea of design. It goes as follows. If you understand that there are relationships between, let's say, the structure, the processing, the properties, and the performance of materials, right? If these things, if you can link them together with some sort of relationship or understanding, then you can exploit that relationship or uh, understanding for design. So all of a sudden, if you say like, okay, I need to have, let's say it's strength. I need my strength to be greater than 500 megapascals. Well, if you understand how structure is related to strength and how you can process a material to get a different property, then all of a sudden you can pick a material, but you can also pick how it's made. Or let's say this, let's say you've got a material that has to maintain a certain property, but it's going to be used in a different environment over here. The environment is essentially processing your material. If you leave it out in the sun for three years, will it have the same properties as the day that you made it? Depends. Depends on the material. If you put it in the ocean and you leave it there for a couple of years, what will happen to it? If it's in the presence of nitrogen or ammonia or hydrogen or oxygen, if it's at a high temperature, what about if you deform it quickly versus slowly? These relationships and understanding these relationships is the heart of material science and engineering. If we can understand those, then we can exploit them to design even better materials, which is a pretty exciting thing. So that is what material science is.